good evening everybody uh, today by chemical engineering sectional committee we are very proud to welcome mr tendra sashabuddhi uh, group technical head fog marshal from pune he have come all the way here to sri lanka colombo we welcome you sir he is going to deliver a lecture on the topic process control opportunities in chemical industry in the process in the present competitive market one has to be more efficient to survive so we are proudly welcoming mr upendra today to with his be in chemical engineering background with 28 years of experience in designing process and systems in various industries be it chemical petrochemical food and beverages alcohol distilleries in name it any industries any markets how to reduce the raw material costs how to utilize the system more efficiently we are here to learn from you sir we welcome you today with my short welcome you thank you good evening let me first start by thanking the institution of engineers in sri lanka for giving us such an opportunity at a very very short notice uh, it's really our pleasure to come here and do a presentation on process control opportunities in chemical industry chemical industry as you know is a vast subject a lot of people call chemical industry as a process industry now what is the process industry organic chemicals specialty chemicals pharmaceutical and bulk drugs or what we today call it as api advanced pharmaceutical intermediates <clears throat> in organic chemicals you take caustic chlorine you know any types of sulfuric acid nitric acid all these forms under or inorganic chemicals <coughs> even water treatment and waste water treatment today is a subject of chemical industry we talk of varieties of food and beverage industry food industry is a subject which is as vast which starts simple from a tomato ketchup goes into different different kinds of materials which we eat you know human being has a tongue and he would like to the tongue would like to explore different different tastes different different products different different type of food all this gives generation to a vast subject of food and beverage industry oil and gas it's one of the most commonly used fuel and right from getting oil from the earth to processing it getting different different products handling different different products again comes as a subject under chemical industry downstream of that refineries petrochemicals another variety of oil what we call it is edible oil or oils and fats soaps the subject simply goes on so what today we are trying to look at is obviously each of its industry has some critical unit operations some critical parameters or applications which are unique to that particular sector but still many of the subjects are quite common for example you take distillation you know any chemical engineer the distillation is the most favorite subject now distillation of different different types you will find practically everywhere except maybe if i leave the inorganic chemicals for a moment the entire subject you will find distillation is there and maybe after doing about 500 plus different types of distillation columns in my career i still find that the 501st column is still different and has to be looked at it differently so many cases you will find that you cannot generalize the terms 
But at the same time, let me try to begin where I am going to make a statement that some of the parts of these kind of industry, I am going to generalize it today so that it can be used and then modified at that particular application slightly to suit the best possible for that particular application. When I talk about different applications, maybe I plan to cover some of these time farm managements, lot of utility sections like boilers, compressed airs, chillers, you know, electrical power and all those which become directly the operating <coughs> cost of manufacturing. Batch reactions, different different types of reactors, distillation columns. Since we talked about food and beverage industry, drying is one of the very very critical subject. The percentage of moisture in a food product makes or breaks the things as you know. So trying and maybe if time permits we will also try and touch upon LLE or what is called as a liquid liquid extraction. Maybe I will continue for a long time on this slide. The reason is this is the spectrum which we are looking at covering today. Now when we talk about chemical industry, most of the times you will find that my raw materials and my finished products, both are liquids. I am going to buy some of my raw materials from my suppliers. They may arrive either in a ship or a tanker, road tanker. I am going to unload that, store it in my tanks. I may require different different conditions to store that in the tanks. Then use it, transfer it for my process. And once the finished product comes back, it is again stored in a tank. And from that, the finished product is going to be sold to my customer, which is again going to be a transfer into a tanker. In short, the management of entire tank farm is a very very important and critical subject. There are aspects like safety, there are aspects like material balancing, there are aspects like interlocks, there are aspects like total kind of consumption patterns and my final products and then what are the yields, what are the concentrations, what are the final accuracies in terms of the percentage of product etc etc. In case of tank farm management, the first subject which comes is how do I unload my raw material. The tanker which is coming, I have seen some plants where you know they get raw material in a ship and the plant is very close to the jetty or very close to the coast. So you are going to actually unload a ship by some pump and then the raw material is going to come to the tank. Now you will find that the capacity of a ship tanker is huge and I may be filling up more than one of my storage tanks by just one ship. I am going to unload the entire ship. There are cases where the actual jetty at where the ship is standing and my receipt area which is my tank farm is many times not few meters but few hundred meters or sometimes even few kilometers. Now how do I communicate? How do I remotely operate my pumps? How do I ensure that there is no spillage of liquids? How do I ensure that there are no safety issues which are unanswered? This is a subject which is beyond even just talking of flow metering. Anybody says tanker unloading means what? The first step is meter the whatever raw material I am tanking. Yes, no doubt about it. 
but along with metering or measurement of flow there are lot of good other aspects i remember we did one job in jewelry in ue in dubai the raw material comes from a ship tanker the plant is very close to the sea shore actually if you go to the first floor or second floor of the plant you can actually see the sea they process the raw material in that plant and then the finished product is again sold by back to another ship or transported to the customers by another ship there is one single pipeline what does it imply from the instrumentation point of view the first thing comes to my mind is the flow meter installed on this line has to be a bi directional flow meter i am going to take in my raw material in one bin and my finished product is going to pass through the same pipeline in other direction now if my flow meter cannot measure bi directional flow i had it second thing is in this particular case you will find obviously the raw material and finished products are going to be different in terms of its chemical properties in terms of its physical properties suppose you take just simple values like density viscosity they are going to be different now is my flow meter's calibration going to vary with reference to different values of density viscosity i have to select a flow meter which has a calibration independent of density viscosity values then only my measurement will be accurate many a times when you are trying to unload or load the ships the volumes which are to be handled are very very large the pipeline diameters are very large another headache although somebody will say that this is a pump discharge still you will find that remember these are most of the times horizontal installations which means the pipeline is horizontal the flow meter is installed on the horizontal portion of the pipe whenever my flow starts or whenever i am coming to the end of my transfer batch i am going to have lot of vapor or air which is going to pass through the flow i am going to have a situation which has two phase flow you know there is no flow metering proven technique for any kind of bi phase flow in fact most of the researches which have been done is how do i eliminate the errors due to the vapor or the air pockets which comes in the liquid which in short also tells me that i have to have an installation of a flow meter as far as possible in such a manner that my flow meter readings don't get affected by the vaporization or the air which comes into the pipeline i may have situation sometimes very rarely but yes sometimes that i may have a partial flow my diameter or the bore of the pipeline is not full what should i do again an issue which needs to be answered thought by the application engineer or by the process control engineer while he is designing and selecting a product and installing that product to get the best results out of it many times the road tanker is emptied into an underground tank and that underground tank because it is underground tank you actually do not need a pump and the emptying of the tanker is just by gravity flow things make it a lot of simple because i don't have to protect the pump dry running especially when my tanker comes to an end but 
from the flow metering point of view moment i am looking at gravity flow my velocities are also less if for some chance my raw material which i am going to unload has a higher value of viscosity which can be because these are at ambient temperatures these are not at elevated temperatures i can have a nightmare in terms of flow measurement many times when my storage tank gets full how do i stop the process of unloading in between and how do i transfer it from one receiving tank to another receiving tank what are the interlocks how do i ensure even what i would level transfer to do use you may have situations which, where the tanks are what we call it as open tanks which means they are not pressure rich tanks open to atmosphere tanks i may have tanks which are underground tanks where the side mounting is just not on i have to have an instrument which is top mounted sometimes from the safety point of view i also need to have a nitrogen blanketing on many of the chemicals for example you look at methanol has to be kept under nitrogen blanket now when you want to talk about the system which has got nitrogen blanketing and i am going to talk about receiving of raw materials and sending that material to process what is the effect of that nitrogen blanketing when my tanker is getting unloaded into the tank my level starts going up and then the top portion where my blanket of nitrogen is there i need to release the nitrogen to maintain the pressure other way around when i start transferring this liquid for the process my level is going to go down and if my level is going to go down obviously that empty space has to be filled up by nitrogen immediately i don't want atmospheric air getting inside the tank i don't want the tank getting into a vacuum situation many times we don't understand what is the effect of atmospheric pressure i have seen huge tanks just collapsing because they are not able to withstand the atmospheric pressure in a vacuum situation so number of times what we actually try to use on a nitrogen blanketing system like this is to have a combined padding depadding valve they call this process is a padding depadding which means you can take the raw material in your level goes up and you can also release the raw material where your level goes down and that much portion of the top vapor space is filled up by nitrogen that's padding and depadding and when you talk about the combined padding and depadding valve what does that valve do as a function it works like a safety valve when the pressure increases and releases nitrogen into the atmosphere at the same time whenever it starts going into the vacuum it has a method to suck in e1 atmospheric air and put it inside the tank there is a flame master built into this wall itself but we find these kind of mechanical walls whatever level of instrumentation automation electronics digital communication and all which we talk we still go as the basic safety using the first principle mechanical things safety wall is still a spring loaded safety wall why do we do that because the spring will act whether there is electricity whether there is a compressed air or whatever it is the thing has to happen so many times in tank form management you look at nitrogen blanketing system like this there are some further serious hazardous chemicals for example ethylene oxide 
You will find very rarely people try to transfer ethylene oxide using pumps. The transfer itself is done by nitrogen pressure. Now look at three situations. I have a storage tank. I have a tanker which I am going to unload. And I also have a reactor where the same ethylene oxide is being charged into the process. Now, my process pressure keeps on varying depending on my process dynamics. If I want to transfer ethylene oxide from the tank to the process, by nitrogen pressure, my tank pressure has to be more than the reactor pressure, then only the flow will take place. And if at the same time my tanker comes in for unloading, the tanker fellow doesn't have time to wait, he will say, Baba, take it out, I have to go back. I have some other job. Now the tanker pressure has to be further more than the tank pressure unless you have a fantastic control system software to monitor, control multiple reactors simultaneously where you are going to do the feeding, manage the tank in terms of its pressure ratings and also manage the movable tanker in terms of its pressure rating and maintain the entire nitrogen blanket safety in this entire operation. It's a tough job. Many times your instruments can give you the wrong reading. You are using a flow meter. For some reason, instead of liquid, you get nitrogen into the pipeline. It's nitrogen blanket allowed. The flow meter may start giving you even sometimes a zero reading because it is designed for liquid. It doesn't measure the gas. You can get a confusing reading. Your software may not be, it's a computer. Computer doesn't have a brain, remember that. Whatever you write in the program, it will try to implement that. But if the person who is going to write the program has not visualized the things, you had it. When I have got the final finished product, I am going to sell it to my customers again as a liquid transfer into the tankers. Now, if I am going to sell you 10 tons or 10,000 kg. If by mistake I put 10,000 2 kgs, the 2 kg is a loss to me. My customer is not going to pay me for that 2 kgs. At the same time, if I put 5 kgs less, that customer is going to screw me. Saying that boss, I paid you for 10,000 and you gave me 5 kg less. How many years I am your customer? You know, all that drama will start. I'll give you a simple example. We go to the petrol station with our car and we tell that fellow, boss, put 1000 rupees petrol into my car. What does he do? He enters 1000 on his meter, puts the loading arm into your tank, says, sir, look at the zero. And once you look at the zero, he presses the start button. Now what happens? You will find that the flow goes very fast up to say 980 rupees. And at 980, the flow starts reducing. Step by step it reduces, reduces, reduces. 997, 98, 99 and stops at 1000. Exactly 1000. Have you ever seen any disputes on this? I have not seen it. Why does it happen? There is a concept called as a digital wall. This digital wall operates with dual set point. So when I start, set start the batch, I was at zero. The wall opens fully. Up to 980, which is say 98%, sometimes it is selectable. 
you can set it at 95%, 96%, 97%, 98%. I set it at 98%. So up to 988 went very fast, the wall is full open. Suddenly at 980, the opening of the wall starts cutting down. So it becomes 100, 95, 90, 85, 80. So and so percent. When I am coming to 9, 98, 999, the wall is actually just 5 percent open. That is why at the end of the batch, I get a very high level of precision. Many times, when we are transferring oil and chemicals from tank to tanker, remember the tanker is standing on tires. The tires are made of rubber bad conductor of electricity. What does it mean? The meaning is the tanker is not grounded. It may have a static charge. Now unless I do a proper earthing or grounding for that particular tanker I can have a major accident if I am transferring some organic chemicals. You will be surprised, I have seen a major accident in one of the factories in India transferring IPA from a storage tank to a reactor. And for some reason, there was an error in terms of the earth. Today that plant is not there. Finished. Just a silly mistake. So these kind of cautions, these kind of interlocks are extremely important, especially when you are handling hazardous chemicals. Chemicals which are like organic chemicals and can catch fire. Nitrogen blanketing is not only from the fire hazard. Many times you will find in food and beverage industry, nitrogen blanketing is used to prevent contamination. When I am buying one product as a food consumer, common man, I would like to have the same test again and again. And I don't want any other test to come to that product. Why nitrogen is used? Creates an inert atmosphere. So nitrogen blanketing is a subject by itself, can be used for various reasons, can be used for safety, many purposes, but handling that is very, very tricky. The designer should know the subject. Now this happens in large plants where you know they have a nitrogen generation plant what we call it as the air separation unit. Air separation unit gives me separate nitrogen out from my air. And then it is a continuous source of nitrogen which is available which I can use it at multiple places in the plant. In some cases I am a small user. I cannot afford to have a nitrogen generation plant. What I do? I simply buy nitrogen cylinders and keep it as a cylinder bank. Remember one thing, when the nitrogen credit cylinder is full and when I start consuming the nitrogen, the volume of the cylinder is same. It is a gas and if it is a gas, what is the effect? Moment I start consuming the nitrogen, the cylinder pressure starts dropping. Look at my PR sizing. P1 is my inlet pressure, P2 is my outlet pressure. My outlet pressure remains constant or has to remain constant. My P1 initially was 140 bar, comes down to 10 bar. What is the turn on that wall? 
Will it be able to give me the 6 kg outlet pressure which I require for my process? Otherwise, my tank pressure and my tanker pressure and weight for pressure, everything is in trouble. So, there have to be lot of thought process, interlocks, which has to go in while you are sizing, selecting, designing even the smallest of the item in the control system. Many times, you know, when I go to typically, I would say a second level or third level of automation industries. For example, in olden days, not the today's situation, let me be very clear on it. Today, the, these industries have also been very highly sophisticated or automated. But if you go back to 10 years old story, you go to a sugar plant or you go to alcohol distillery. When you start talking to that person about automation, the first reaction is automation doesn't work. I don't want automation because it doesn't work. Sir, I have wasted so many thousand rupees. Many times, you know, we engineers create our own bad name. Many times we compromise on many of the design aspects just to satisfy the economics. Many times we instrumentation sales engineers knowing what is going to happen <coughs> still go to the extent saying that faster this will work. I know about it's a lot of the moment the density is going to be changes my system is going to give me an error but that is the cheapest flow available so I sell it and customer buys it he doesn't know the physics behind that what is the end result? sir instrumentation doesn't work the instrumentation doesn't give me the accuracies which I want actually how it is? it's other way around it's a computer why are you using computers in everyday life? The very simple reason is the computer doesn't need a tea break. The computer doesn't need a lunch break. It doesn't have an afternoon, morning, night. It doesn't need to sleep. For 24 hours, 365 days, the computer is going to actually do the same work with the same level of efficiency, which a human being cannot. So if I tell that computer to do it in the right fashion and if I give him the inputs which are coming from these field instruments or if I give him the final control elements rightly, there is no chance for that computer to make a mistake. But somebody has to put that thought before just buying. Many times you know people just buy loose instruments. Give me one kilometer, give me one wall, I will manage. He has not thought about this entire aspect. And that is the place the control system engineer comes in a picture where he has to understand the process, he has to understand the dynamics, he has to understand the pump, he has to understand the level, he has to understand the dipole pressure, and he has to understand the safety interlock and still give you the result. If you do everything, you get fantastic results. I have seen customers after 20-20 years really give us absolute red carpet. And many times you know some of my colleagues really get astonished. What a reception sir you are getting. Because a well designed process control gives you that kind of a result years after year. If you select it properly, design it properly, install it properly and also maintain it properly. It's like a continuous process. So, many times we talk about this tank form management. The second part which is a co association of this is many times I have to use different different solvents. Organic solvents, 
alcohol, IPA, you know, these are very common new solvents. Hexane. Now I have a storage tank. I have my process distributed in three, four areas. I need to transfer a fixed quantity of these solvents. I am just making solvent as an example because I talked a lot about liquids and chemicals. So let me have a different word, but this gets applied to any liquid. I am going to transfer that. Suppose let us say in one particular reactor, I want this solvent as 2000 liters or 2000 kg. Remember difference. In one place I am talking of volume and second place I am talking of mass. 2000 liters, 2000 kg. Now I have to precisely transfer 2000 kg. Many times in one plant I have six or seven different solvents and I may have 30 or 40 different users of that solvent. My flow meters are common. I may have a situation where I will use one flow meter per solvent or I may use one flow meter per time. Concept is totally different. If I am using a flow meter, one flow meter per solvent, the density viscosity of that solvent remains constant. For a moment, forget about the temperature changes and effects of winter and summer on the density viscosity values. But the liquid is same. So theoretically the density viscosity values don't change much. I can have a flow meter whose calibration can be dependent on density viscosity. I simply change the position of the flow meter and put it to the receiving switch. Now I have six or seven different solvents. The flow meter is going to be common for all of them. Now, unless I have a flow meter whose calibration is independent of density viscosity, I can have errors. Many times, my flow meter is here, my receivers are at different different places. The physical distance between the flow meter and these reactors is different for every reactor. I may have a reactor selection wall. Now when I have transferred 2000 liters or 2000 kg from that flow meter, whatever which has passed from the flow meter, I have counted. It has to reach the destination. I have to empty the pipe. Otherwise, the pipe volume is going to give me an error. Somebody thinks that I have a flow meter here, I have a wall there. Moment 2000 is reached, I will close that wall. What is the lag? Now for seven outlets, wall positions of seven walls are different. The distance and the pipeline volume is different. Am I going to get compensating for the seven different things? How much time will it require for commissioning the system and how much time I keep on proving? And if tomorrow the customer calls me for an error, how will I find the error? Whether the error is from the flow meter or whether it is the calculation error in the composition. What are the rules? Many times, I'll tell you an example. We did one job in a perfume industry. Similar, solvent transfers. Now today I make one perfume product. Tomorrow I make a different perfume product. Everything will not smell. Now, the reactor is same, the pipeline is same, the flow is same. If I have not cleaned the system, I have not emptied the system and if 
some contamination from the previous batch remains my next batch is gone we know the cost of perfumes we pay a few thousand rupees for few ml and if the reactor is 2000 liters reactor minimum few lakhs of rupees are gone my control system cost is definitely gone in one batch the customer will kill me i am not allowed to make smallest of the error so how do i ensure that my entire pipeline gets empty how do i ensure that there is no contamination what type of fittings should i use now remember this is not a biotechnological contamination work in fermentation biotechnology or a micro biology i am going to have a bacteria which is going to create a contamination and that's why i have a sterilization cycle where i would like to actually kill the contamination what we call it is sterilization we did a job for the paint industry every color shade is different the reactor is same if i have not cleaned my system from the previous color i may have infinite number of shades and then i am in big trouble so paints pigments colors perfumes these are examples where i am looking at contamination word in a different way but <coughs> like pharmaceutical or like biotechnology a slightest of the error is just not on Now this is as far as we were talking till now is handling of raw materials, storing them, using them, transferring them, also the finished products. Another common thing which is very frequently used in industry is some of the utilities. Typically, you require steam, you require compressed air, you require cooling water it were chill water lot of electricity and also sometimes chilled brine forget about specials like you know nitrogen and all those things forget about it. once upon a time when we used to discuss the first statement some engineer used to make sir compressed air is not a cost forget about it could you have started to realize that many times the compressed air is costlier than water nobody has put that thought a small hole or a small leakage in my fitting in a compressed air circuit can cost me thousands Remember, liquids can be stored. Gases cannot be stored in that sense. When I generate steam, I have to utilize it. Otherwise, it will condense. My energy is lost. So, if I am going to require more steam, I should be generating more steam. But moment I require less amount of steam, I should be also reducing my generation. I have no control. Once the steam is made, it is made. Nothing can be done about it. I have consumed my fuel. My energy bill is already gone. So I look at a boiler which will actually give me a steady steam pressure. You will be surprised even today. When you go to a process plant, and especially in the boiling houses, where they consume lot of steam, you talk to the operator. 
He says 50 percent of my problems are because I don't get a constant steam pressure. I don't get a steady steam pressure, and half of my energy is wasted only for picking up the phone and shouting on the boiler engineer or boiler operator, saying that boss, I want a 10.5. You are giving me it. Instead of opening 40% of the wall, I will open 75% of the wall. Why does it happen? Many times, especially in batch processes, you know you have batch reactors. On one floor, you have 20 reactors. Each is a batch. Nobody can predict how many reactors will be on steam, how many reactors on will be on cooling water, how many reactors on chilled water at a time. It may be all empty, it may be only one, or it may be zero for steam. All on cooling side. Now, the moment I say one reactor is on steam, the steam valve for that particular reactor is open. When ten valves are open, suddenly the pressure stops, drops. Cooling water. You see the pump is coming, uh, and the cooling water header is coming from this side. The reactors on this side get a very good pressure of cooling water. The last cooler doesn't get anything. What do you require? You require a management to ensure that sufficient cooling water or sufficient utility pressure is given to every reactor. I may have a situation that the exothermal is taking place in the last reactor. The jacket pressure starts going up because of the heat generated inside the reactor. The operator opens the cooling water valve fully, or even a DC a sophisticated system opens the cooling water valve fully, but the cooling water doesn't enter into the jacket because the jacket pressure is more than the cooling water pressure. How will it enter? You are in trouble. Temperature shoots up. There can be hazards. There can be losses in yields. Many times, an entire batch is lost. Why? I have a very sophisticated control system. I have a PLC. I have a DCS. I have software. I get everything on my mobile phone. Nobody has thought this. Finally, remember what an instrumentation engineer can do is open the valve fully. Beyond that, he cannot do anything. And after opening the valve fully, the flow doesn't take place. So, the instrumentation engineer can do nothing. So, unless that control engineer goes beyond his instrumentation and looks at all these aspects. Instead of looking at pure hardware, he is not going to deliver what he is supposed to deliver. In case of boilers, we talk about safety, drum level controls, furnace pressure controls, maintaining the negative draft. Excellent. How do I do? Or how do I provide a steady steam pressure on variable loads? Maybe with a solid fuel, gas, very easy to control. Oil, very easy to control. Just open or close the valve, more or less. I can adjust my fuel firing rate. Gas is a fuel which. Ignite so fast that the system dynamic is also very fast. If I have boilers, which is a weight fuel, it takes time for it to catch fire. It's a boss. Where do I give you steady steam pressure when suddenly somebody opens the body which line one? Talk about predictives, control mechanism. 
If I have four chutes in my gasified boiler, do I arrange my operations of my firing rate in such a way that I am really operating my boiler efficiently? Do I ensure my combustion control ensures that I don't have unburnt bagas falling down? Don't worry to talk about oxygen trimming. Fantastic concept. Baba, first look at your unburnt fuel. It's so best. Then you start removing your excess air, reducing your excess air, and then increasing your efficiency. Today, on a running boiler with second level of softwares, it is possible for me to calculate the efficiency in real time. Like I measure pressure, like I measure temperature, I give you time versus efficiency continuously. Possible. And if I am measuring that, then I can also improve upon that. So, how do I share loads when I have multiple boilers? I may have a situation where I have four boilers with different fuels. One boiler is running on biogas which is theoretically a free fuel. Second is running on wood chips or coal or a gas. Something is on oil. I have to look at it. Comments. Possibly the biogas fire boiler is always run at full load. I will never reduce the load firing rate of that boiler because it is a free fuel for me. Then I will play with the efficiencies of other boilers for their firing rates. The high efficient boilers or my low cost fuel boilers, I will load more than my economically costly boilers. That's the way one looks at what is called as a load management of multiple boilers. Same concept applies to compressed air. I will never have one compressor. I will have multiple compressors. And like somebody opens a steam wall, somebody opens a compressed air wall. And suddenly that much is my output which is good. Can I manage my loading unloading patterns of multiple compressors depending on the load? Can I actually measure the free air delivery of the compressor? Remember, when the compressor, manuf compressor manufacturer gives you a guarantee on the free air delivery, he is talking on air flow and the suction. Your flow meter is on the discharge. Unless I do a calculation of P1 or P1 equal to P2 into upon T2, I will not be able to get what is actual and sucking in and what is there in Q. So one needs to look at that and the loading and loading patterns of the compressor. Same funda applies for shedding. What is my total energy? which is going to go for a chiller. They talk in terms of BT. Simple formula MCP delta T. I should measure the flow of chilled water or chilled man or whatever it is. And I measure the two temperatures. The simple formula gives me what is the total energy load. In terms of British thermal unit or kilo calories or whatever you want. Electricity. One single instrument can give me 20 different parameters on three phase circuits. VI, cos phi, kilowatt, M. I can actually monitor all this. 
and even use the softwares available today <coughs> to physically calculate my batch cost. It's not only raw material cost, but even my electrical consumption, my steam consumption, my cooling water duties, my chilled water duties. All that gets added and it exactly tells me that my per kg cost was 252 rupees 35 paise. And then you can have targets. How do I reduce that 250 to 250, 250 to 240 and so on. My colleague made a statement that in today's community world, especially in many industries you will find that you don't have control over your raw material price. You don't have control over your final product price. It is either decided by the market or it is decided by the government policies. How do I generate profit? Very simple. Unless I am able to bring down my operating costs, I am not going to generate profit. How do I bring down my operating costs? I have to operate efficiently. So the entire structure of utility management actually is going to talk about operating efficiently. How do I improve? How do I improve? How do I improve? Most of the slides I have spoken, I am going to skip them. Then we come to the process control part. Where we take examples of, let us say, a batch reactor. In many industries, you will find that a batch reactor is actually a multi-purpose reactor. They call it as MPP, multi-purpose plant. What does it mean? In that reactor, I am going to make one product today, second product tomorrow, third product day after tomorrow. Very common in bulk drug API pharmaceutical industry. In summer, I make products which are required for monsoon season. In monsoon, I make products which are required for winter. So, the same plant, same equipment, same reactor, maybe same raw materials or slight changes in raw materials, operating conditions vary. I make different products. Look at this reactor. Maybe this is a 10 kL reactor, a 10,000 liter reactor. Today I make a product which is 10,000 liters. My tomorrow's product recipe is only 5,000 liters. Day after tomorrow only 2,000 liters. My control walls are sized for 10,000 liters. Now if that steam control wall opens, for a 10,000 litre batch and the same amount of opening it does for 2,000 litre batch my temperature is gone I have a sequence which tells me that I should heat from 30 degrees to 120 degrees in say 2 hours yesterday I had to open the wall 65% today I have to open the wall only 30% Another situation in this which gives one more dimension is I have multiple reactors. When one reactor is on heating, my steam pressure is 2.5. My three more reactors are on, my steam pressure drops to 2. Will my control wall give me the same flow? No. How do I 
predict all this. Many times there are reactions where the photons shoot up. I have gone from 30 to 120. At 120, I close the cooling water control valve. Uh, sorry, the steam control valve. The temperature rises from 120 to 140. See, in half an hour's time. And suddenly, at 140, the exothermic shoots up. It goes from 140 to 147 in two minutes. So, bloody glass and reactor. My temperature sensor is not going to be there in two minutes. My thermal is glass. A bad electrophyte. And by the time I measure and my control system opens and responds, my batch is gone. Because the condition given to me is you have to reach 147, but you cannot cross 149. I am finished. What do you need here? I actually look at a system which has got a plenty of controlling ends. These are highly non-linear parameters which you have to solve with linear computers. The computer cannot draw a curve, it draws only a segment. It draws only a straight line. So if you want to draw a curve, it breaks into multiple number of segments and tries to join it as a curve. It never becomes a smooth curve. So I am trying to solve non-linear equations by linear computers. Remember, it's not easy. Same way you look at the wall. On one side of the wall I have steam, on the other side of the wall I may have chilled brine. What are the mechanical issues you want? And due to these mechanical issues, if my steam wall starts passing, traditionally my colleagues in instrumentation, the moment you size a wall or select a wall for steam, you go for a harder internal. What is called as a stelliting or nitriding. Which means I am not going to have leakage class 6 on this wall. And if I am not going to have leakage class 6 on this wall, when I am on chilled brine, that steam wall is going to start passing steam into the brine. Where is my heat transfer calculation? Unless one analyzes and understands the implications of all this as a overall picture, just by hardware selection, he is going to mess up. And then the end result is, so instrumentation doesn't work. Many times, like I said, we did talk about one job for colors. Each color code is a different recipe for me. You will be surprised in this particular plant, for one reactor we had made as many as 64 different recipes. And like that I have 9 or 10 different reactors. Each has different different recipes. You need to look at the, not only the recipe management, but even the turn down ratio of the instruments. Turn down ratios, minimum maximum controllability values of the walls, minimum maximum measurements possible by the flow meter. Another example I will give you is hydrogenation. In case of hydrogenation, when you are going to charge the hydrogen in the process, the initial consumption of hydrogen is extremely high and then the hydrogen consumption starts dropping, dropping, dropping. There are cases where just for one hydrogen line I put 
three parallel flow meters because my initial flow requirement is so high and when the reaction comes to the end the hydrogen consumption is so low that my that big size flow meter is not going to measure it many times your flow meters have a turn on of 1 is to 10 so if i am at 200 my lowest possible is 20 my flow rate goes to 1.5 what do i do the second flow rate goes from 22 to 2.2 i have a small 10 percent of water still it is 1.5 i need a third flow meter which is 0.2 to 2 and then you need the entire sequence to analyze where I am in the terms of process and what is going to be my hydrogen consumption pattern according to select the flow meter and select the one for hydrogenation. Many times you need to maintain the ratios of raw material A versus raw material B. And suddenly, there is also an interval saying that in all this bargain, the temperature should not go beyond this value. Otherwise, you should reduce the rate of B. And moment you reduce the rate of B, it has a relationship with the rate of B. Many times, in a batch reaction, there are three raw materials. A is a liquid, I have a flow meter or I have some system, I measure it and add. B is also a liquid, I have some system, I measure it and add. C is a power. How much I want to add? 50 kilos. How do I add 50 kilos? 10 bags of 5 kilo each. Whose responsibility? The operator is going to measure one bag drop, second bag drop, third bag drop, suddenly he gets a phone call or suddenly his mind goes somewhere else. In one batch he adds 10 bags, in second batch he adds only 9 bags, third batch he adds 11 bags. Hmm. And third to even know, the control systems doesn't know what he means. There is no reason. Unless I have some sort of a predictive mechanism in place, I will not know how fast or how slow this batch is going to go. Sometimes that one bag exists added may shoot the temperature very fast. If I am going to relax for a few more minutes of my habit, because by the time my temperature sensor gives me a reading on that glass light reactor my batch is already over my customer is going to pack me off saying thank you very much so you need to think about all these aspects before designing a control system one needs to also look at the operator mentality Many times the operator thinks that the automation is going to kill my job. Human mentality. So he will find excuses after excuses to bypass your automation. He will say, sir, accuracy is not coming. Sir, we are not conversant with this. So there is software. I have not learned computer language. I don't know anything. I know how to run a smartphone in one day. But I cannot understand computer language. Because back of my mind tells me that this automation is going to put my job in trouble. Let me tell you last 28 years I have never talked about manpower reduction by automation. We talk about process improvements, we talk about utility savings, 
we will talk about optimizations we will talk about improvements in quality we will talk about you know product costing so many things we don't talk about manpower reduction here is an example where what i am trying to do is i am trying to put the entire operation sequence of the batch in the operator's language i am not going to teach him a different language i will start speaking in his language i will make my what is called as a sequential function chart in his language so he has to just click because he understands his process we do not expect the operator to learn computers except you know basic operations of windows opening closing what we expect is he should be knowing his process very well and he will be able to operate this another advantage which comes is you will see this reenter prerequisites before i start a batch on one particular reactor i have some 10 defined conditions which have to get satisfied now some of these conditions may come from physical contact or an instrument in the field for example reactor temperature there is a sensor which will give the value for example the agitator motor whether it is on or off there is a contactor which will tell me whether the agitator is running or not but there are some things like whether a hose pipe is connected or not the operator has to do it the system gives you a sort of a documentation where the operator has to acknowledge that boss yes i have connected the hose pipe and i clicked it it also makes him involved in the system he knows that his mistakes will be caught even when some of the alarms come when those alarms were acknowledged i was sleeping in the night shift for two hours so i did not acknowledge any alarm for those two hours it gets caught indirectly another advantage which you know many times in front of you you have a lot of entrepreneurs you don't have any chemical engineers in front of you but many times the owners of the plant from their point of view the secrecy of their process the secrecy of the receipt of their part is very important many times it so happens that suddenly you have five export operators and they resign simultaneously because one of your competitors simply pick them up at a fantastically high package can i use automation to actually relieve myself from that human intelligence you will be surprised we did a very large job in gujarat state of india we used to discuss so many times with the process people project people we wrote the entire dc software signals recipe management what we are talking with you my questions to customer used to be sir what is the density what is the viscosity what is the pressure what is the temperature what is the minimum maximum flow rate are there any suspended solids is it a gravity flow or is it a pump pressure is stainless steel 316 okay or you need any special materials my entire dc screen says r1 r2 r3 r4 parameter 1 parameter 2 parameter 3 parameter 4 three years after completing the project for some reason i went to the particular plant that time i got to know that this plant is making as it was 
I'm not concerned. What do you mean? Another example is you know alcohol industry where they make different different premium brands of whiskey brandy man. That particular test or that particular smell or that particular flavor of that whiskey on which it is sold. What is the real crux? I should be able to give you the same flavor day in and day out. Now the recipe of that is known to only few operators. When I invite the new operator, it is very difficult for me to achieve the same accuracies, same performance. If I use automation over a period of time, the operator doesn't know what brand of whiskey he is making, or whether he is making whiskey or whether he is making brandy or whether he is making rum, he doesn't know. My program only tells me that brand 1, brand 2, brand 3 is select depending on the demand. And then the entire recipe of brands. My secrecy of my process is also well maintained. And since the computer system is owned by me or the automation is owned by me, I am not bound for the so called threats of somebody picking up my operators or somebody picking up my process engineers for a high package. This is one more aspect which many times people don't understand while implementing automation. I don't know whether we have time for distillation columns, but maybe in just few minutes I will try to cover. Again, distillation as I said is a very vast subject. You have batch or continuous columns. You may have pack columns or tray columns. You may have binary or multi-component systems. You may have columns which are operating in atmospheric or multi-pressure or many times very very high level of documents. I remember some of the cases where we have done something like 1.5 to 2 torr kind of vacuum pressure on distillation columns. Even the pressure transmitter fitting can give you a wrong reading if the fitting is not of good quality. If the fitting is not tightened properly, if your Teflon tape layers are less, you can have fun. For days, you will try to search where the problem is and you will not be able to find out. And you are not able to reach the composition which you want. As I said, in distillation forms, very difficult to standardize. But still some of the control schemes are very common like control of feed flow rate. Many times you also report the feed temperature because feed temperature also tells me if there is a pre-heating water that water in thermic content in the feed. Then sometimes I link up the steam with the total amount of heat is to be done. If I have bad problems I practically look at the vaporization rates. On condensers, I can have different controls. Many times, I have, let us say, the first condenser which is having cooling water, the secondary condenser is having chilled water, or first condenser having chilled water, secondary condenser having chilled brand. Condenser also require the vacuum control part which comes on the condenser. Accumulator, reflux rates, distillate rates, sometimes maintaining the reflux distillate ratios. And many places the side stream draw controls. 
In some cases, if you have isotropic conditions, the side stream drop hormones also become very tricky. Because in case of isotrop, it is very difficult to find out the temperature versus the composition relationship on that particular train. So you may have to look at a tray which is a few plates lower than my actual drop. So in this situation, how do I compensate for the lags? Discretion is a very slow dynamics process. Where should I take temperature and where should I take pressure as my master parameter? And how do I make in some places the my entire process controller fast enough or slow enough in a discretion form is a tricky subject. Many times you need field instruments which are suitable for hazardous area or what you call it as a flame proof or explosion proof requirements. Proper steam controls. You know, you have five columns, two columns require a lot of steam, three columns won't require more steam. And if you don't have proper steam controls on individual columns, these two columns take out their entire steam and balance three columns are starving. Very, very common example, very common phenomenon. So, we need to have proper control for steam is very critical. In most of the distillation columns, when you size the control wall, you have a very limited delta B or pressure drop across the control wall. Slightest of the throttling you do and it creates a back pressure and your entire pressure temperature relationship is in trouble. Many times the vacuum control is achieved by a control on the bleeding line. Most of the times nobody is able to tell you what will be the flow rate across this wall. very difficult to size this wall and number of times we go by past experience and mentally we prepared to change the k value of the wall if required in order to get absolute proper control for vacuum. Many times one needs to understand that although I say T I C temperature indicating control the temperature controller is actually a composition controller and not a temperature controller. When I link that temperature with composition, then only I get those results. I am not going to spend time on the modern control system because these are available everywhere today. Just look at the method by which you can make the operator more comfortable, the engineer more comfortable and that should give you the sufficient things on the modern control systems. So what can be the benefits of automation? Yes, savings on utilities. Savings on raw material and finished product quantities. But the most important thing which you can get out of a good process control is consistency of the results batch after batch, hour after hour, shift after shift, day after day, years to be. I also save on vestiges. I try to improve the efficiencies of my equipment. Many times I get maintenance alerts and then plan my shutdowns and maintenance, routine maintenance or planned maintenance. It gives me a lot of reports which helps me in evaluation and improvements and optimization and also issues involved like secrecy. You know, 
things like that which also come as a hidden benefit from instrumentation. So, a well designed, well automated process control system can give you infinite number of benefits if you implement it properly. I think that's what I wanted to convey. Thank you very much for your time. If you have any questions, we are ready to take it. Thanks. You know that is where I was coming to and I mentioned it indirectly, not so directly many times during my presentation. People look at only flow material. M amount of sizings will be done, calculations will be done. My flow meter accuracy is plus or minus 0.1 percent of major value. I say the best accuracy available. Maybe with that also I won't get plus or minus 1 percent. Why? N number of reasons. Some of the reasons I mentioned during my presentation. One important reason which one needs to think of. You know, a lot of times these kind of examples, we are staying in subcontinent. India, Sri Lanka, weather wise, they are not different. The climate conditions are practically same. In summer, our temperatures ambient are 40 plus. Remember 40 plus is the temperature which your thermometer shows or your MET department shows. What is the surface temperature of the pipe? Many times 55, 60 plus. You touch the pipe and you will get it. What will happen to an organic chemical? You are all never never. The flow meter manufacturer tells you that my flow meter takes care of the vaporization. Takes care of the vaporization in what? He simply takes out the vapor part as a non and removes it. There is no flow meter which may be able to buy this flow. Remember that, you know, we also, like I said, we instrumentation people spoil our instrumentation. The reason is we try to tell the customer what we want to tell. We don't tell them the truth. Now, how do I ensure my vaporization is removed? Do I have a continuous recirculation sequence? Do I have a SOP which tells me that I am recirculating for so many minutes before I start taking it to the tanker loading or batch transfer or solvent transfer, whatever it is? Am I ensuring that I am installing the flow meter on a vertical line so with flow from bottom to top? Do I have a air regulator which will remove vapor in the pipeline? Am I using the digital wall which actually gives me exactly what I gave you the petrol pump example. You know, you unless look at all these together, you are not going to get the results. But let me tell you, we have even done a similar exercise for a drum filling application. It is a 200 liter drum which I want to fill. And many times, 200 liter or 200 kg, the flow meter is a mass flow meter, so it actually gives me a kg. Now, every time, initially for the first couple of months, still the customer gets satisfied that he only drum he puts on a weight scale. Because for ages, he has been using a weight scale. So my flow meter matching system, 
puts 200 kg and that fellow puts it on the wheels scale. Sir, your readings are not matching. Unless that customer gets some confidence for a few months, he is not going to remove that wheel scale. And it is our responsibility as a control engineer to ensure that he gets that confidence. Which means what? I am not only looking at accuracy, I am also looking at consistency of that performer batch after batch. You take an example of perfume dosing. A slightest error in terms of few errors here and there is going to give me a different product. These are the cases where more than the flow meter you have to look at an overall picture and then you can get those results. The problem is somebody sells the flow meter, somebody sells the valve, somebody sells the controller, somebody sells the PLC, somebody gives the software. At the end of the day when there is a problem, nobody is there to take the responsibility. <coughs> that is the problem. That's why, you know, in today's presentation, I talk instrumentation 10%. 90% of the content was other things than instrumentation. More than the instrumentation engineer becomes a data sheet engineer, he's finished. He doesn't do anything. Unless he comes out of the data sheets and looks, in an hour of his wall or flow meter or a temperature sensor or something like that, beyond those standard written down consultant specifications. He is not going to get the results. That is the difference when we look at it as a system engineer rather than an instrument engineer, a process control instrument engineer or a process control engineer. I have used the word process control, I have not used the word automation. I am not using the instrumentation. The reason is I am looking at the total overall picture and then applying that to that particular input. Good question, thanks. Anything else? No, it's a very good one. You have given me a half one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you, yeah. the real reason of digitalization or you know smart transmitters, digital communication, you know what is the real reason? The man is becoming more and more lazy. There is no other reason. Okay, there are some advantages. For example, when I was looking at individual single loop controllers, linking of one controller to another controller was difficult. 
I have to physically do hard wiring. I may have to put a lot of things like you know in those cases ratio relays and all those which we used to do in the pneumatic instrumentation. Today you go to a ship, possibly you will still find the same mechanical or pneumatic control mechanisms. In a distributed control or a sophisticated control, you do have advantages because I do the software. It's very easy for me to change or modify a program. No doubt about it. But the real reason of digitalization or so-called advancements in technology is because man is becoming more and more lazy. In Saudi Arabia, in hot summer, I have to go to the field transmitter to change the range or span. Can I sit in my air-conditioned control room and put just two terminals and change the span? This is the way the digital evolution of today is looked at. Yes, there are some positive things like those days the transmitter accuracy would be used to be one percent. Today only very constant talks point zero seven five percent or something like that. There are improvements, no doubt about it. Instead of an analog sensor, if you have a digital sensor, you are going to have an advantage. But Again, same thing. The real reason, the way the man has used it, is to make himself more and more lazy. Nothing else. I think it's seven o'clock. That was the time. So. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your patience, and thank you very much again for giving folks Marshall this opportunity. Thanks the Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Prince Rasuluddin. Uh, Actually, uh, it was a very nice presentation. Uh, he's a very good speaker, we know. Uh, I have been participated in a lot of uh, his lectures and trainings. Uh, actually, during, uh, uh, I, was, uh, I was asked to prepare uh, the flyer for this presentation, this lecture. So, for that I was uh, searching uh, his Facebook profile. So, I was surprised that I was looking at uh, a wrong profile uh, because uh, there's nothing written in about his engineering career <laughs> in his profile so if you go to the facebook profile you can see he's a harmonium player he's a good musician uh, so i watched his lot of videos he has done a lot of uh, uh, shows also in india so if you want to explore his uh, musician career you can go to facebook and see uh, anyway, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Vintra Asubuddhi, uh, Technical Head of uh, Forbes Marshall Group, and uh, carrying out a lecture here uh, on behalf of very on behalf of Chemical Engineering Sectional Committee of IESL. Uh, thank you very much. Okay.